Uh, welcome everyone. Have a good. Uh, hope you have had a good uh, day so far. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, so this is uh, we have come here for the defense of uh, Mohit Sharma. Um, Mohit um, is uh, 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 is an expert on data visualization, data analysis, um, and uh, has been working on this problem of bivariate uh, data visualization for the past uh, several years towards his PhD. Um, Mohit comes from a very interesting, uh, has an interesting academic background um, where he has interspersed uh, uh, all his academic uh, sojourns with a uh, with an industry sojourn. So he is uh, he did his undergrad, then went to the industry for some time. Uh, I think at that time it was Directi, maybe Amazon uh, and Directi, yeah. and then he went to Triple uh, IT for his masters, and then again spent. Uh, uh, a year or so in uh, in the industry, and then came to do his PhD. Um, so uh, and he's done a wonderful job so far, uh, finishing up his uh, PhD work. So um, so he's going to be talking to us about bivariate data visualization, uh, where he has done um, a lot of work. He has contributed both in terms of his uh, in terms of algorithms, uh, in terms of um, visualization system design, and uh, applications, uh, closely working together with the chemist. So, um, stage is all yours, and uh, we look forward to your talk. Okay. Um, hopefully, all of you can hear us online. Uh, in case you are not able to hear us at some point of time, please send a message. We'll be monitoring the chats. Okay. Well, thank you, Vijay. Uh, hello, everyone, and thank you for joining. My name is Mohit Sharma again, and I will be talking about my PhD work today titled Topological Structures and Operators for Bivariate Data Visualization. And I will quickly start with a few examples to motivate the need for bivariate analysis. Often interesting phenomena in various science disciplines are dependent on complex relationship between different properties. For example, in oceanography, we have this temperature and salinity field and we look uh, into the complex relationship between these two fields in order to identify and track water masses. And the relationship between vapor and cloud fields of a hurricane are helpful in identifying and extracting interesting substructures of the hurricane. And these properties are often expressed in static or time varying scalar fields defined over a geometric domain. The scalar field maps every point of the domain to a scalar value. For example, here, we have mapped every point on the Bay of Bengal surface to its corresponding temperature value. The blue ones are the low temperature values and red ones are the high. If we have defined just a single scalar field over the domain, then we call it a univariate field. And if we define more than one, then we call it a multivariate field. My research focus is bivariate field, that is when we have defined exactly two fields over the domain. When we talk about multivariate analysis in general, then the field is quite broad and we borrow techniques from multiple other fields. For example, there are works which focus on improving the interactivity to handle multiple fields. Then we have techniques from statistics, for example, using correlation measure to identify the dependent variables. Then we have works which use machine learning techniques, for example, identifying some interesting features or interesting segments in the domain. And we have works which use pattern matching based techniques, for example, identifying segments in domain where multiple variables are following a particular relationship. My research area is majorly about using topological constructs for bivariate analysis. Topology on a very high level means study of shapes and connectivity. We are going to see that in uh, more detail in the later slides. When we talk about topology, the related works can be broadly classified in three categories. One can be to come up with novel topological structures, such as Jacobi sets or feature level sets shown on the right. Another category is to come up with efficient computation methods of the existing well-defined structures. For example, here I have listed few works to compute fiber surfaces shown on the right. Then we have a line of work which, focus on, which focuses on applying the existing structures to study different and new applications. On the right, we have used a structure called Reeb space to study a water dimer. My work heavily uses these fiber surfaces and 
The first computation method for fiber surfaces was introduced in 2015 and when we started working uh, uh, with fiber surfaces and related structures, there were quite a few computation methods and uh, their application works. And we identified few research gaps and we plan to explore these four main directions. As I have already mentioned that there were very few computation methods of the existing structures. So there was a scope of improving the computation aspects in terms of efficiency and correctness. Then applicability of the existing structures was very limited and it was majorly dependent on user interactivity. So there was a scope to improve uh, the applicability aspect. Then not all the uh, univariate structures have been uh, generalized to the bivariate space. So there was a need for generalizing uh, the existing univariate structures and there was there is still and uh, there is still a scope to simplify the existing structures so that they can be applied to different uh, other applications and in past few years we have touched all of these four points we presented an output sensitive method to compute the fiber surfaces and we presented techniques for analyzing static and dynamic uh, bivariate, bivariate fields that also reduce the user interactivity to some level and we have shown effectiveness of these new techniques to study electronic transitions and we have generalized two concepts from univariate one is flexible isosurface to flexible fiber surfaces and the concept of tracks to bivariate setting and we have uh, recently submitted this work Jacobi set simplification in this we have simplified Jacobi sets where, a part, where one single field is taken as time. Uh, in the last work, my contribution is minor towards the application side. I will just be discussing the first three contributions uh, in later slides. Coming to the major thesis contributions, our first work was preliminary univariate work. Here we focused on augmenting an existing contour tree. Contour tree is a very popular structure in uh, topological community. community. And this work lays the foundation for our first bivariate work that is computing flexible fiber surfaces. In this work, we presented the output, output sensitive methods method for computing the fiber surface that further facilitates to compute individual components of a fiber surface. Then we focused on reducing the user interactivity to analyze bivariate fields. And we presented two novel operators in our next contribution. And limitation of this static bivariate field analysis or the operators we suggested was that they were applicable only to a fewer number of instances. And in order to handle that, we presented a static uh, representation, summarized representation of a time varying bivariate field where a large number of instances can be handled. And both of these works, uh, for both of these works, we showed applicability to electronic transitions. And both of these were done in close collaboration uh, with the chemists from KTH Stockholm and we were able to uh, provide some useful in insights in the application. Now before going into the details of these contributions, I would like to introduce some background terms. First, some terms about the univariate fields. Here we have a two-dimensional scalar field. The blue color represents the low values and red color represents the high values. A level set is the set of points where all the points are having a constant ISO value K. It is also co called as ISO contour or ISO surface in higher dimensions. Then a level set can have multiple connected components. A single connected component of the level set is called as a contour. Critical points are the points where these level sets change topology. For example, at G and D maxima, the contours are originating. Then at saddle E, they are merging two contours are merging into one component and eventually at H, A and F, they are vanishing. This evolution of level sets can be captured in an abstract representation called a contour tree. Here we can see that arcs originating from G and D are merging at saddle E, which represents the evolution of contours from G and D merging at E. This, uh, the arcs of contour tree segment the, our uh, domain in segments of consistent level set topology. For example, the arc from G to E represents the segment of domain where every contour or every level set has a single com uh, connected component. When we also uh, add the regular points 
in this contour tree, we call it an augmented contour tree. Coming to the bivariate terminologies, if we define more than one field over the spatial domain, then we call it a bivariate field. In this toy data set, we have defined one field as the z-axis and one field as the distance from this origin. And in inset, we have shown the contour trees corresponding to both the fields. A continuous scatter plot is a continuous two-dimensional histogram where x-axis represents one field we are considering and y-axis represents the other field. In this continuous scatter plot, we are able to, uh, we are able to identify certain interesting regions. For example, the region or the bivariate values which are having higher frequency. Here the darker color represents the higher density or higher occurrence in our bivariate field. And sometimes we are able to see some distinct features. So we can conclude that those features are, uh, those range of values are having a distinct behavior in our bivariate field. A fiber is a bivariate analog of isosurface. In this particular image, the pink surface is isosurface corresponding to one field, that is the z-axis, and yellow is the isosurface for the other field. The points where these two isosurfaces are intersecting is called a fiber and it represents the set of points where the bivariate field is having a constant value. And in this particular case, this black fiber corresponds to this black sphere shown in the continuous scatter plot. If we move this black sphere over this control polygon, then we get a collection of fibers and we call it a fiber surface. And this polygon is called as control polygon or fiber surface control polygon. And it is an interesting tool to extract interest, in, uh, extract the region in this range space, which we are willing to explore in the spatial domain. We are going to use this control polygon uh, repeatedly in uh, later slides. Coming to our first uh, contribution, uh, in order to highlight the importance of this contribution, I want to point out to these two very recent works. Contour trees have been studied for more than two decades and still there are works to compute augmented contour trees or contour trees in different scenarios, for example, parallelizable and uh, scalable in these two. We posed a problem of augmenting a contour tree on the fly. That is, I'm given the univariate field, scalar field as input and its corresponding contour tree as input. And our goal was to augment this contour tree on the fly. And we came up with a very simple bread first search based algorithm that is from leaves of these contour tree, we start exploring the neighborhood in the spatial domain and we keep on appending the regular nodes to that particular arc until we reach the other end that is 10 from 4 to 10 in this case. There were some more technical details to handle the edge cases. I won't be going into detail uh, of them. With uh, this particular work, uh, in terms of uh, running time, we were able to achieve the standard runtime which other works achieve because eventually we need to add all the uh, regular nodes to contour tree. So in terms of performance, there was no benefit. Perform the benefit was in terms of storage space. So we were able to save around 10 to 20 times of storage space because now we don't need to store the augmented contour tree. We can compute that on the fly and we just need to store on this the smaller version that is contour tree. And we were able to support some interesting applications. One is partial augmentation. We can augment the arcs uh, individually now instead of augmenting the com uh, complete contour tree. And that further helps us efficiently uh, computing the other, uh, efficiently uh, utilizing the other applications. One is feature aware selection. So if I want to highlight the points which are, which correspond to a particular arc of the contour tree, I can just augment that instead of uh, augmenting the com uh, complete contour tree and I can highlight them in the spatial domain. The application which I'm more in interested is in efficient isosurface computation. So if I don't have this contour tree and I want to compute, ISO, uh, compute the isosurface corresponding to a iso value, then I'll have to traverse all the cells in my spatial domain. And if I want to, uh, if I have the contour tree along with my uh, univariate field or augmented contour tree, then in order to identify this pink isosurface here, I can look at the neighboring points uh, in the contour tree, neighboring to this horizontal, ice, uh, horizontal line corresponding to the ISO value for this pink ISO surface. Since I have access to those uh, neighboring points directly due to the augmented contour tree's availability, I can directly go to the spatial domain and extract this ISO surface without traversing the complete 
uh, special domain. And it also facilitates me uh, access to the individual components of this isosurface. Every R corresponds to one component of the isosurface here. This individual extraction of the uh, isosurface components is called as flexible isosurface computation. And we, want to, we wanted to generalize this concept of flexible isosurface to flexible fiber surface in the bivariate setting. And that brings us to our uh, first bivariate uh, contribution. Uh, the existing met method at that time was traversing through the complete set of tetrahedra to compute any fiber surface. And we wanted to optimize on that. For that, we suggested an output sensitive algorithm. And that algorithm further helps us to compute this fiber surface, these fiber surface components flexibly. That is, instead of computing these two oxygen atom, now I have access to the individual component that is individual oxygen atom in this case. In order to explain the method, I will again explain few more uh, terms. This isosurface uh, of one particular field is called as restriction of that field. And I compute the contour tree corresponding to the other field restricted to this isosurface. And if I compute infinite such restrictions and contour trees on top of them, and if I stack them, then the set of critical points of those contour trees are called as Jacobi set. So Jacobi set act as a bivariate analog of critical points. And if I also retain the connectivity information, that is, I stack the contour trees completely, then we get a Reeb space. This Reeb space is a two-dimensional uh, structure. So every point can be highlighted just with the two scalar fields in consideration, F1 and F2. And in two-dimensional space, different surfaces of this Reeb space overlap with each other. And that is why it has these representation issues and also the computational uh, issues. And that makes us less suitable to use for different applications. This Reeb space segments our bivariate field into the segments of consistent fiber topology, similar to the contour tree, as contour tree was segmenting in the uh, uh, segments of same level set topology. In this case, we have this blue, red, and white segment corresponding to three surfaces of this particular Reeb space. And this green one is a saddle Jacobi fiber surface. As we can see here, we have a single fiber in the uh, blue segment. And as this fiber crosses this saddle fiber surface, we have, a, we have two different fibers in, the, uh, in two other segments. So in order to generalize the uh, idea from flexible isosurface computation to flexible fiber surface, our first intuition was to use the Reeve space that is bivariate analog of contour trees uh, to have the same uh, similar type of algorithm. But Reeve space has these computational challenges, so we could not use it and we relaxed the requirement to just using the Jacobi set. That is, instead of this, we are going to use this structure to come up with an algorithm. And we were able to suggest a simple four-step uh, algorithm. Here in this picture, this is the same Reeve space in two-dimensional space, but we are just going to use the boundary edges instead of the surface information. So I have just shown them, uh, shown this surfaces, these surfaces to, uh, for the context. And our goal is that given this control polygon edge UV, I want to extract the corresponding fiber surface without traversing the complete set of tetrahedra. This is a projection of the three-dimensional surface in 2D, or is this the histogram that you showed but colored based on the... Uh, this is this three-dimensional, uh, two-dimensional Reeve space. Actually, it is two-dimensional, but... Right. Huh. No, but that picture, it's a histogram or is it a projection? It's a projection. It's a projection. It's a projection. Okay. Yes, not a histogram. So our first challenge here was, uh, first of all, we wanted to identify the fiber surface corresponding to control polygon edge UV. And our challenge was to identify the nearest Jacobi edges that can help us to move faster towards this control polygon edge inside the spatial domain. And in the absence of this connectivity information, that is these sheets, it was a hard uh, problem. And we solved that by extending a line through this control polygon edge and checking which of the Jacobi edges are intersecting with this particular line. So in this particular case, we were interested in identifying this green 
intersection, intersection with the green Jacobi edge and this blue one and we are getting two extra but for sure we are going to get the required fiber surface with some extra computation. After identifying these intersections in the spatial domain, we uh, execute a directed search towards U and V to identify the seed tetrahedra which contain either U or V. And after identifying all the seeds, we run a restricted breadth first, breadth first uh, search uh, to identify the tetrahedra in the vicinity of seeds that contain exactly, uh, that intersect exactly with this control polygon edge. And that way we are able to uh, discard rest of the tetrahedra or traversing rest of the tetrahedra in this space and we just traverse through the tetrahedra that intersect with this particular line. In terms of results, uh, our algorithm pro produced exactly the same results that the existing algorithm produces. In this picture, on, in the top row, we have the CSPs or continuous scatter plots for different data sets and in these lines are the control polygons corresponding to the desired fiber surface that we are trying to extract. In the next row, we have the fiber surfaces uh, computed using our algorithm and in the bottom row, fiber surfaces computing using, uh, computed using the existing algorithm. Visually, they appear to be the same and we also provided some quantitative measures uh, in the paper to uh, emphasize the correctness and we also suggested uh, provided a theoretical guarantee. In terms of performance, we were able to perform better in certain cases where the number of Jacobi edges are much lesser than the set of tetrahedra because we have to compute this uh, Jacobi intersections. If Jacobi edges are of similar order as the set of tetrahedra, the, then we are essentially taking the same time as the brute force algorithm. So in certain cases where the Jacobi edges were lesser, we were performing less, uh, we were performing better, but only in the serial implement, only uh, if we compare with the serial implementation of uh, existing algorithm. With respect, uh, the existing algorithm uh, prior to us could also be parallelized and our algorithm was not parallelizable. So we were not able to give uh, better performance in all the cases and certainly not better from the uh, parallel algorithm. But we were able to support this application of computing the uh, uh, fiber surfaces flexibly. If we look at this red control polygon edge, the third CSP, the Jacobi edges intersecting with this control polygon edge, if we visualize them in our spatial domain, then those Jacobi edges form these nice clusters around the features of interest. And those features of interest are actually the fiber surface that we are looking for. And we can interactively select an individual control polygon edge in any of the features that, that we want to extract. And we can extract the corresponding fiber surface component instead of computing the complete uh, fiber surface. Now, when we were dealing with these bivariate fields, a common, uh, two common issues uh, we uh, faced. One was identifying bivariate features. In a univariate setting, we can segment our spatial domain with respect to let's say level sets and we can get these interesting uh, features. A contains B and B contains C and this nice hierarchy, but such a thing is quite complicated uh, to achieve if we have, if we are dealing with two fields. Then next challenge was interacting with these CSPs. The CSPs depend a lot on the data set which is provided and it is very hard to predict what shape we are going to get. And it is very hard to uh, predict which of uh, the bivariate range values or where exactly these interesting patterns are lying which we want to highlight inside spatial domain. For example, in the first one, where should I select this notch by this blue control polygon or something else? So identifying these things was quite difficult automatically and a lot of the things were, depend, uh, were dependent on the interactivity. And we tried to solve these issues to some extent in our next contribution that is static bivariate field analysis. In rest of the discussion, uh, I'm going to use this application. So the methods that I'm going to suggest for static bivariate uh, analysis I'm going to use this guiding application, study of electronic transitions. So I want to introduce a little background first to this application. If we are given a molecule which is undergoing uh, an electronic transition, charge is moving from one place to other during electronic transition, the 
this is the molecule uh, that is undergoing and we have two fields defined uh, on this molecule that characterize the uh, electronic transition. One is whole NTO that is a measure of charge lost at every point and second is particle NTO measure of charge gained at every point. And I want to highlight that these two fields are not exactly the com uh, exactly complementary. Uh, there is a complex relationship uh, between these two fields that is charge lost is not negative of charge gained. Um, I won't be going into the into the details of how they are computed. That is a lot of chemistry. But what we were interested uh, in is to identify when this molecule is undergoing the uh, this uh, electronic transition, which subgroups are behaving as donor, which subgroup have lost charge, which subgroups have gained charge, and in order to do that, the existing uh, methods were using either side-by-side -side analysis of such isosurfaces overlaid over the molecule or they were using some statistical measures. We wanted to come up with a technique that uses both the fields together as a bivariate field and then it can study. Um, and in order to solve this problem, we suggested two novel operators. One is CSP peel operator that further helped us to quantify these CSPs with respect to application and one is CSP lens operator that further helped us to automatically select these control, uh, control polygon rather than interactively. Coming to the details of these operators, the CSP peel operator provides us a domain directed axis of ex uh, exploration. What do I mean by that? Many times we have some extra information about our bivariate field from the domain expert. For example, in this particular application, chemists were interested in studying this one ring highlighted with blue colored atoms separately and this pair of rings as separately another subgroup. So we had this extra information and we utilized this information to define our bivariate features. We segmented this subgroup inside do uh, spatial domain and the other subgroup. Now the field, the bivariate field restricted to these segments become our bivariate features of inter uh, interest. So this way we are able to suggest a way to define a bivariate feature. Here they are segmented geometrically. We can even have some topological methods uh, to uh, define them. In this particular case, after uh, segmenting the spatial domain, we plot the CSP restricted to this top bivariate feature, which is aligned horizontally, where the horizontal axis is the whole NTO that is charge lost and vertical axis is the charge gain. And because it is aligned horizontally, we can conclude that every point which corresponds to this segment has higher whole NTO value that is higher charge lost and it is behaving as donor and other one is behaving as the vertical one as acceptor. Now using this operator we studied a molecule of two subgroups thiophene kinoxaline. This, this particular molecule or these two subgroups either independently or together are useful in designing conductive polymers. So there was an interest to study these, uh, uh, this charge donation and charge uh, acceptance with respect to uh, the, uh, by considering this particular molecule and we wanted to study when we change the dihedral angle that is geometry of this molecule, how this behavior changes. In this top row, we are moving from 0 degree till 180 degree in this case. The dihedral angle is changing between the two subgroups. The second row shows the CSPs for complete molecule. The next row shows the CSPs just restricted to thiophene, thiophene subgroup. And by looking at these CSPs, we can uh, come up with some interesting findings. One is that CSP corresponding to the zero degree and 180 degree conformation look almost the same, which is supposed to be the same because both the conformations, uh, the molecules in both the conformation are having similar pi bond uh, setting. The conjugation is almost same except for one atom switch to the other side. And as we move from 0 to 180, uh, 0 to 60, then 90, then 180, the donor behavior of thiophene is decreasing because the CSP is shrinking. And at 90, because the conjugation is minimum, we have the least donor behavior from thiophene. And same can be observed in the quantities. This, these quantities represent the donor strength and they are computed using these field CSPs. Higher donor strength means donation is higher and negative means that is accepting uh, the charge. That's an acceptor. In zero degree and 180 degree conformation, the quantities are almost the same. 
and in 90 degree it's the minimum interesting observation is that none of 0 degree or 180 degree have the highest uh, donor behavior the relaxed geometry is having the highest uh, donor strength which was uh, kind of opposite to what we are accept expecting moving on to the second operator this provides us another range directed axis of exploration if we don't have any information about the um, bivariate domain, let's say bivariate field, let's say in the previous one we had this information how to segment the field, but we still want to run some queries on the bivariate field. In that case, we use the complete CSP and we define those queries mathematically and based on basis of that definition, we can come up with these masks shown in gray and these masks are uh, we term uh, we call them as csp lenses these lenses can be masked with the cs uh, complete csp to extract the output corresponding to the query that is in this case the points in the csp the top one uh, the top csp lens is the donor csp lens and bottom one is the acceptor one and in this case we are we want to extract the donor points in this particular csp by applying the donor lens and after extracting this donor segment or donor CSP from the complete one, we can highlight where exactly are these points lying in the spatial domain using these control polygons. And these CSP uh, lenses help us to define these control polygons automatically. That is, give me all the points that have this particular donor strength. Instead of selecting interactively, which we were doing before, I can define these uh, control polygons now mathematically and I can uh, simply extract that this particular donor strength points are lying in the left ring that is thiophene and thiophene is behaving as donor and the other one is behaving as acceptor. Now these two lenses and most of the multivariate uh, analysis work fall into this framework called dual analysis of feature space and data space. I will just take a few minutes to explain this uh, framework. In all the multivariate uh, analysis tasks we have certain features that define the feature space and we have the data samples that define the data space. By visualizing our data inside the feature space, we can identify certain interesting patterns the data is following and we can identify the outliers. And by identifying them, we can either retain or discard some of the data samples. And then we can compute certain statistical measures such as mean and variance on the remaining data samples across different features. And we can identify the features that are able to retain the original behavior of my data and the features which are not able to retain, we can discard them. So there is this close linkage between this feature space and data space, and that motivate, uh, us, motivates us to study these two spaces together uh, as a joint interactive visualization uh, task. In our case, these CSP lenses form the feature space, and our features are this donor and acceptor behavior, and CSP lens operators help us to interact with this particular space. And CSP peel operator helps us to interact with the data space that is actual bivariate field. Now, this uh, joint interactive framework motivates us to use the two operators together. In this case, in this uh, uh, image, we have the CSP lenses on the x-axis and CSP peel operator on the y-axis. If I just focus on the first column, that is, I just want to apply the CSP peel operator then I get for kinoxaline this particular CSP. And it has a mix of donor and acceptor behavior. It is very hard to conclude whether it is uh, behaving as a donor or acceptor and which parts are behaving as donor and acceptor. If we introduce this additional axis, CSP lenses, then on the right side in the bottom row, this red rectangle highlights just the donor part of kinoxaline. So we have applied the C donor lens on this uh, peeled CSP of kinoxaline. On the right, uh, in the right image, this process is shown in detail. First, we apply the peel operator to extract the kinoxaline's peeled CSP. Then we apply the donor lens to extract the donor uh, CSP uh, of kinoxaline. And further, we can select the control polygons to map the parts inside spatial domain which are behaving as donor. So. One part of this uh, uh, subgroup is behaving as acceptor and one as donor in this particular conformation. This is 120 degree dihedral angle. Now, 
there was a limitation of these two operators. We can only study a limited number of instances with them because we have to manually look at the CSPs. And that brings us to our last contribution that is time varying bivariate field analysis. And in this, we were trying to come up with a summarized representation of a large number of instances. Before introducing that, I would like to introduce a similar uh, representation in univariate uh, setting. If I have a univariate field and different time steps of that field, let's say at T0, I have defined these three features, A, B, and C. At T1, C breaks into D and E. At T2, D and E merge into F. And some other evolution also happens with uh, A. I want to capture this evolution and this hierarchy in a single representation. In the bottom, we have a structure called nested tracking graph, which is defined for univariate field. Here, the red edges show the hierarchy. A contains B and B contains C. And the blue edges show the evolution of features. C breaks into E and D and D and E merge into F. Our goal was to come up with similar representation, but not exactly the same because we don't have a notion of hierarchy uh, in bivariate setting, but something track based representation. And in order to do that, first we were supposed to define the bivariate features. In our case, we considered as atoms uh, the bivariate features and we were able to extract the bivariate field corresponding to them using the CSP field operator. Then next challenge was that this CSP uh, of an uh, atom evolves in time. There is some evolution. And we want to capture this evolution in some static representation. And in order to do that, I wanted to have such a track based representation. I have some start point and some end point, And I'm able to capture this evolving CSP in some form of track. If I want to uh, reach to this type track based representation, then I'm supposed to somehow describe the CSP in some form of feature vector first. And we tried with many different features. Uh, let's say for us, area of the CSP was important, eigenvectors, that is orientation and symmetry of the CSP was important. We tried, but we were not able to come up with a consistent uh, uh, result. And eventually, we selected this approach. We, fin uh, we finally uh, used this approach from computer vision and image processing uh, domain, image moments. So image moments can describe an image in this way. If x, y is a particular pixel of the image and x represents the x coordinate and y represents the y coordinate and i, x, y is the intensity of that pixel, then I can compute these image moments as a weighted average using this equation. Uh, I keep on changing i and j, I can compute the different order of moments, m0, 0, m0, 1, m2, 2. And there are results which, show, uh, which say that enough number of uh, image moments can uniquely determine an image and vice versa. For us, the challenge was in order to describe a CSP using these image moments, which moments to select, which are important to us because they can be computed up to infinite order. And we finally selected these four moments, M00, M20, M11, and M02. Reason was M00 captures the area of our CSP and a smaller CSP is not too active for us and a larger CSP is important to us. Then M20, represents the variation along x-axis. If we just put 2 and 0 in this, uh, if we, uh, in this formula, then we are going to get x square multiplied by intensity at every pixel. And horizontal CSPs for us are important because they are the donor CSPs as we have seen. Similarly, M02 was important representing acceptor. And M11 says that charge is moving from a nearby location to the nearby location. That is, that particular atom is locally active. So these four moments were important. Uh, we were able to compute them, but next challenge was we wanted to visualize these four moments in two-dimensional space, and we started exploring standard dimensionality reduction methods, and our aim was to have a deterministic uh, uh, track, which also captures the patterns we are interested in. MDS was giving us some discontinuities across time steps when we were projecting using MDS. Disney required definition of uh, hyperparameters. PCA suited us the best. And we were able to capture some interesting insights uh, after using PCA. Here is one result uh, from this method. Here we are trying to study this particular molecule. It has two rings, R1 and R2, and two bridge atoms connecting these two rings. And we wanted to see if geometry of this molecule is changed along this uh, uh, bridge, then how 
the donor acceptor behavior is changing, what structural, uh, structural changes are happening in this particular molecule. And we ran our method and we uh, computed these tracks shown in this figure. Here, horizontal axis represents the time and vertical axis represents the projection over second principal component. So, there are multiple tracks corresponding to multiple atoms in this ring. I have highlighted just two main tracks that correspond to these bridge atoms, C1 and C8. And by looking at these tracks, we can clearly identify that in this highlighted blue rectangle, there is some interesting activity happening. And again, some interesting thing is happening in the later time steps. And when we explored these time steps further using fiber surfaces, we, would, uh, we could identify that in these time steps, this complete ring goes green, that is it is behaving as toner, and other ring goes red, that is uh, behaving as acceptor. And in the later time steps, there is an additional bond forming, that is three rings are existing. So these insights were quite uh, interesting from a uh, chemist's point of view, just visualizing them and capturing this behavior in, this, uh, uh, in these tracks. There are additional results which are there in paper. You can take a look at that, uh, although it's in writing when we submit that paper. This brings us to the conclusions and potential future works that we are looking for. With respect to first uh, work, we presented an output sensitive method, uh, a new method to compute the fiber surfaces. And impact was that there is a recent work to compute uh, fiber lines in two dimensional uh, uh, spatial domains. And this particular, uh, our method suffers from uh, computing Jacobi set, uh, Jacobi edge intersections, and that is the bottleneck of uh, computation time. We can improve on that time in future by coming up some intelligent method of uh, computing the intersection, let's say partitioning the Jacobi sets, Jacobi set and computing the intersections in parallel, or simplifying the Jacobi set. Uh, if, if we are able to simplify that, then that also helps us to identify interesting fiber surfaces, uh, because they are going to lie, hopefully lie around the uh, prominent Jacobi edges. These two work, static bivariate field analysis and time airing bivariate field analysis, they have given us direction to use these constructs, CSPs and fiber surfaces in more intelligent manner rather than just selecting some control polygon interactively and then seeing a fiber surface. We can actually uh, do some interesting analysis as I have shown with the uh, electronic transitions data sets. And in this time varying by very field analysis, we have also given a loose notion of similarity or dissimilarity between CSPs using these uh, moments. Now, we were able to show some interesting results with respect to this electronic transitions application, but in future we would like to make these uh, operators or these tracks more generic so that they can handle any general application. There is one more line of work, computing uncertainty, Tushara Thavle's uh, group work on that and a recent paper was uh, there from that group to compute fiber uncertainty. Uh, so this is also one line of work, although we have not explored it and in general, there is a lot of scope uh, in this bivariate or multivariate domain from topological structures point of view because it is very, uh, at this point it is very hard to have some intuition how these two, uh, how two fields are behaving, how their relationship is uh, behaving. There is enough theory from univariate side of the things but there is nothing, uh, much, not a lot with respect to bivariate setting. Even when I, when I was working on the flexible fiber surface paper, I had to uh, fall back to the univariate theory to build an intuition uh, to come up with an algorithm. With that, uh, I almost come to the end I, and I would first like to thank all of my co-authors. First of all, my advisor with whom I have spent a lot of time and I was able to get quite optimum uh, guidance from him, not more, not less. And sometimes we even spend two hours, three hours just thinking and not speaking anything. And then I would like to thank Professor Ingrid and Professor Talha from Linshoping University for providing their insights uh, in terms of method development. And I would like to thank Singna, a PhD student from Linshoping University, to provide us the data set for our first uh, static bivariate field analysis work. And I want to thank Professor Matthew and Nana from KTH Stockholm to take care of the chemistry side of the things for us. And I also want to thank the reviewers, uh, Professor Christoph Garth from RPTU Germany and Professor Shanmugnathan Raman from, from IIT Gandhinagar to spend time 
to review my thesis. And I want to thank everyone offline and online to spend their time, you know, valuable time and listen to this talk. If you have any questions, I'm open. Thanks a lot. Thank you.